Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann and I pastor the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina and friends, I come out here this, this morning to bring to you the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and to plead with you concerning the life of your child, to plead with you concerning this, this momentous decision, this great decision that you have before you this day, my friends, concerning whether or not you will take the life of that child or not. And friends, this is more than just about the life of that child. This is also about your soul. This is about where you're going to go when you die. And friends, if you're out here today, it manifests the fact that you are not right with God and that you need to be reconciled to Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It fills me with great joy to know that the Lord Jesus Christ reigns as King of the universe and that all who embrace Him and all who come to Him will be saved from their sin, will be freed from the shackles of iniquity, that they themselves do not have to fear the wrath of God that will be poured out on the day of judgment against the wicked, but that they themselves will be received into glory forever. And friends, I commit myself and my church to help you if you so choose to spare your child's life this day. Friends, I, I know people, waiting lists of people that are, are, are anxious to adopt that child if you so desire to give it up for adoption. There are options, friends, even just next door. The Piedmont Women's Center, just next door, friends. Please allow me to help you. Allow my church to help you. There are people who are praying for this place, praying for this evil to be put to an end. Friends, don't murder your child. And that is what it is. It's not just a foolish decision or just a, just a, a bad idea, my friends. It is murder. And God says you shall not murder. You may find yourself convicted over this. You may find that God convicts you as the gospel is preached. And therefore, it is my plea that you would get out of this place and that you would repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That not only your baby would be saved from the horrible fate that abortion is, but that you yourself would be saved. That you would receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ as a gift of grace to your account. So friends, please know that I do deeply care for you and that I desire that you embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and that your child's life is spared. And as the Gospel is preached this morning, as the good news of what Jesus has done, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His constant intercession on behalf of His people, as that message is preached, I plead with you to believe it. To believe it with all of who you are. To, to deny yourself, as Jesus said in, John, in Luke 9, to deny yourself and to take up your cross daily and to come after the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is free indeed. All of the free grace of God but following after the Lord Jesus Christ will cost you everything. Will cost you your life, friends. You must count the cost of following after Christ. But it is glorious. It is certainly glorious. For He Himself has promised to come back and to bring His people into eternal glory. And I want you to be a part of that great host of people. But you must believe the Gospel. Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Friends, it is powerful to change your life. You may be in, steeped in fornication. You may be steeped in drug abuse and drunkenness. And even here today, you've set in your heart to murder your child. Friends, but there is hope for lost sinners. There is hope for wretches. For I myself am the chief of sinners, and yet God has chosen to save me, to pull me out of the mire of iniquity, to save me from the sewer of sin. And friends, so too can He save you, for I'm worse than you. Ultimately, as the Gospel is preached this morning, it is my heart's desire that, even above the effect that it has upon men, is that God would be glorified, that God would be exalted as Christ Jesus is lifted up as the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. So may God be glorified in this time indeed. The text of Scripture that I would like to focus on this morning 
is found in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21, and Paul the Apostle here is writing, and he writes these words. He says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. These two verses very simply and straightforwardly speak to the fact that mankind needs righteousness. Friends, see, God is a holy and righteous God. He is so great and perfect, and He demands perfect righteousness. However, it is something that we ourselves cannot do. We cannot perform as God demands of us. But Christ Jesus, the God-man, He has performed perfectly. He has fulfilled all righteousness on behalf of His people. And His righteousness is imputed to them. See, friends, God right now, if you are outside of Christ, sees you as you are in your sin. Sees you in your iniquity. However, for those who are in Christ, the Father sees them as in Christ. Sees them as having lived Jesus' life. This sin of abortion, my friends, will damn you. It will, it will bring upon you eternal destruction. However, the righteousness of Christ is offered to you that you might be saved from the wrath of God, that you might be forgiven of your sins and received into glory. And it is apart from the law. That is, salvation is apart from any materious work. It is apart from your effort. My friends, if you think that you can enter God's kingdom by your own effort, then you are lost. If you think that you can somehow bring yourself to God through any mediator but the Lord Jesus Christ, even if that be yourself, then you're lost. Friends, I plead with you, do not think so highly of yourself. Do not be so proud as to trust in your own righteousness. He who trusts in himself will come to ruin. Paul said later in this very chapter, in, in verse 28, he said, For we maintain that a man is justified. That is, that word justify means to be made righteous, to be made right in the eyes of God. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. It is, on no, it is, it is of no effort on man's part. It is all free grace so that God gets all the glory. Friends, free grace. The offer is free. It is not something which costs you anything, which is so glorious. Because perhaps you've made a great wreck of your life and sinned against God tremendously. And perhaps you are thinking, how possibly can I be saved? My sin is too great, therefore I will just continue to heap upon myself more and more sin because it doesn't matter anyways, I'm forever lost. Hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah 55, 1 says, Ho, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. He will have compassion on him and to our God for He will abundantly pardon. Friends, God's grace is laid open today, is, is put forth before you. Don't slaughter your child. Don't go through with this. There are people who will stand with you and pray with you and support you. Think, I think about the many churches who are involved in ministries, pro-life ministries that are there for you. Even this place next door. Don't do this evil, friends. Instead, Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord.
And as I said a moment ago, it is all by God's grace so God gets all the glory. So that God is praised. That God is exalted. And may God indeed be exalted as the Gospel is preached. Before we go into this text in detail, the context here, Paul is speaking on the fallenness of sin, or the fallenness of man, the depravity that we are in, the lost state we are in, but how great God's saving grace is. How great God's mercy is. As it is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The beginning of chapter 3 and in chapter 2, and in chapter 1, he thoroughly preaches the bad news, brings forth the bad news of our sin and how we deserve God's punishment for our sin. But here in verse 21, we find a transition in the book of Romans where Paul brings forth the good news of God's grace, how He has brought salvation about by His might and His power so that He gets the glory. So that brings us there to verse 21, which is where this transition is found. So let us consider that. Let us consider how we receive righteousness by faith. Verse 21, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Again, as I said earlier, it is all of God's free grace. Friends, don't think that you can walk away from this place and go to some church and say some silly little prayer that you're converted. Don't think that by your materious deeds you can just be, be made right with God. You have to be saved, friends. You've got to be, as Jesus said in John 3, 3, you've got to be born again. Born again by the Holy Spirit of God. There's an urgency with this, friends. There's an urgency. Hell is, is hot and ready to receive the wicked. It is apart from the law. We could not earn righteousness by the works of the law. Think about God's Ten Commandments, friends. His moral law. His perfect law which shows us His holy character. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not blaspheme. Friends, I know that you've committed these, uh, these sins against God. I myself have. I know the evil that is in my own heart. Or the command... You shall not murder. The command which you have set out this day to break. Certainly we could not keep God's law. We could not obtain righteousness by keeping God's law. It's an impossibility because of our fallenness. It is not that God's law is the issue. It's not that God is the problem. It is man not able to work himself up to God. Not able to be righteous as he ought to be. But the text does say, it is apart from the law. What is? The righteousness of God has been manifested. That is that God gives righteousness. He gives perfect righteousness apart from works. Apart from the works of the law. We see it all the way back in Genesis, in the very first book of the Bible. In Genesis 15.6, it says that Abraham believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. The Ab Abraham, the, the father of the nation of Israel, we could say. The father of all those who were of the same faith of Abraham. He believed in God. He believed that God could save him. That God could give him the righteousness that he could never earn. And the, and the God of glory certainly did do that. That's why Paul says later, down, later on in Romans chapter 4, in verse 1 he says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So Paul's saying, okay, if Abraham was saved by his works, then he would have something to boast about. He could, he could say, yeah, I've done this, I've performed. I've, I've pulled my way up to God by my own power. But then he says in verse 3, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Verse 4, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. 
If someone has a job and they work and they receive their wages, it's not a favor, it's not a gift, it's what they earned by their work. And if salvation is the same way, then why would we be grateful to God? It's something we earn by our own work. But what does he say? In verse 5, But to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Friends, you are ungodly. You're outside of Christ. But for the one who does not work, does not try and merit his own way to God, but comes to God through the mediator of the new covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ, they are saved. Their faith is credited as righteousness. We could put it differently by saying that they receive the righteousness of Christ. Oh, my dear friends, there is a great responsibility that you now bear as the preaching of the Gospel goes forth, as the Word of God goes forth, because you're responsible. There's an active part to your, to your listening to the, to the Word of God being preached, because you must decide what you are going to do. It calls, the Word of God divides, and it calls for you to stand either in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ or in the kingdom of darkness. The Word of, of God demands reaction. So friends, that is why the plea is even more urgent that you would come to Christ instead of being lost eternally. That you would embrace Jesus Christ and not go through with this evil. Not submit yourself under the care of those murderous doctors, those nurses. The blood of those precious children are on the hands of you doctors and nurses. And you workers in this place, this house of death, this den of demons, this place of darkness. Going back to the text, it says the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. My friends, there is a glorious aspect to the gospel, and that it is, it is not something that was inaugurated in the New Testament, in the sense that it was first revealed there. No, my friends, it was brought forth even in the garden. The gospel has always been the same, that Jesus Christ would come into the world to save sinners. Even in Genesis 3.15, we find the promise of Jesus coming to destroy the works of Satan right after Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And it is the gospel that is attested to in the Old Testament. The prophets testified concerning the glory of Jesus Christ, concerning His power to save sinners. In fact, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53 said this concerning Jesus. And it's interesting because this was written around 700 years before the Lord Jesus had even been born. So he writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He says in verse 3, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. Quite glorious that is, my friends. The Gospel is the Gospel that was also a testify, attested to in the Old Testament. It's the same Gospel, both Old and New Testament. That ought to give you more reasons to come to Christ because the Word of God, historically speaking, has proven, has proven itself to be the Word of God. The Gospel has been vindicated by the events of history. And then he says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. That is that God, as I said, gives the righteousness of Christ to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul talks about this later in the book of Philippians. In Philippians 3, he speaks of his desire 
He says in verse 8 of Philippians 3, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Even in Paul's own testimony of conversion, he says his hope for heaven, his hope for glory is that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is sufficient for him to be saved. It is sufficient to save him, to justify him before God. For there is coming a day when you will stand before God, whether it be through your own death or through the resurrection of Christ, when Christ, or excuse me, the, the return of Christ, when the, when the righteous are resurrected and the wicked as, as well are resurrected. There is coming a day, my friends, when we will stand before the Holy One of Israel. God is holy. Holy and righteous is He in all His ways. Perfect in all His deeds. You must understand the character of God. We, we must grasp who the God of glory is. What His identity is. God told the Israelites in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. He says, Thus you are to be holy to Me, for I the Lord am holy. And I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. God is righteous in all His ways. As we see there in Romans uh, 3, God gives righteousness because He is perfectly righteous. God is so good. So good. And when I say good, I'm not necessarily speaking on His disposition. While He is truly good in that manner, I speak on His moral perfection that there is no flaw in Him. He never does that which is wrong and perverted and wicked. And we see it in His law. We see it in the giving of God's law. God is also gracious. We think about the beautiful weather today. The sun shining down upon you. That testifies to the grace of God even upon the wicked. God is gracious even to send rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. And He is so merciful to hold back from us what we so deserve. We all deserve to be in hell for our sins. However, He holds back that great punishment that we deserve. And right now, He is keeping you from that place. He is patient, giving you time to repent. Giving the wicked time to come to His Son. We even think about women who murder their children. Women who go through with this evil deed and slaughter their own child. That precious gift from God. Children are a blessing from God, friends. That God even then keeps them from the terrors of hell. Giving them time to repent. Please, friends, do not do this. I give myself to help you. And I speak not only for myself, but for my church, that we will help you. Just next door, the Piedmont Women's Center, they will help you. Certainly, we're not here just to get you to not do this and then to leave you hanging, friends. We are here because not only do we care for that precious child, that image bearer of God, but also we care for your life. The love of God, my friends, is so great. So great indeed. Come to Christ that the love of God might be shed abroad in your hearts. That you might not be hate-filled. A hate-filled thing is to kill your child. I can't think of something more hateful. It is an evil thing to murder a man out in the field as he, as he is working. But it is a much more evil thing to murder a man as he is in his own house, in the comfort of his home, in his bed sleeping. So too it is to kill a child in the womb, the safest place that the child could be there, receiving nourishment and care from its mother.
but concerning God's character and His holiness, we see it given, we see it put forth in His law, in God's Ten Commandments. For God says in Exodus chapter 20, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. These are just a few of God's commands, certainly not all of them, not all of the Ten Commandments. But these commands given here reflect unto us the character of God, the perfection of God's character, His holiness. For we think, why does God forbid murder? Because God is not a murderous God. Why does God Himself forbid spouses from being unfaithful to one another? Because God is a faithful covenant-keeping God. And I'll say this very briefly. Friends, what's so glorious about the God of glory is that He keeps His, His promises. If you put your trust in the Lord to provide and to take care of you, and to provide and take care of your child, what does the Scripture say? Matthew 6, says, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Friends, if you seek first God's kingdom and obeying and glorifying and honoring the Lord Jesus Christ and you, you, you give yourself to the care of the Almighty, then the promise is that your needs will be met. Oftentimes when I'm at abortion, uh, the abortion clinic here and in the past when I've done ministry at abortion clinic in Orlando, Florida, that the women often will tell me, well, I don't have the money or I don't have the means well, friends, I tell you this much. I serve an almighty God. The God of Scripture has all power, all might, and all strength. All things are at His disposal. It is a very small thing for the God of glory to provide for you. It is nothing for Him. His power is absolutely infinite. So take heart, friends, and come to Christ that you may live Going back to Exodus 20, verse 15 says, You shall not steal. Again, God owns all things. Therefore, God has the divine prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with that which He owns. Verse 16, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The condemning of lying. Why does God do that? Because God, as the book of Hebrews says, it is an impossibility for God to lie. It is against His perfect character. And therefore, He demands of the children of men that they not lie. So there, so far, nothing is wrong. God's character is glorious. His law is delightful. His law is perfect. So what is the issue? The issue comes when it comes to us. The issue is put forward when, it, when we look at ourselves in light of God's holy law, in light of God's perfect character. Because we ourselves cannot keep His law. In fact, that first command that I read off, that first command that I just read off to you, you shall not murder. Friends, look at where you are this day, having set out in your heart to murder your child. That is breaking that command. Murdering your child is, is murder. It's still a human being, regardless of how small it is. You doctors and nurses, you workers here at this place of death, the blood of children is upon your hands. Your murderer is in the eyes of God. You shall not commit adultery. You say, I've never been unfaithful to my spouse. Or perhaps that is why you're here, because you have been unfaithful to your spouse. And perhaps now you've become pregnant. Friends, that child did nothing wrong. You may have sinned greatly against God, but that child does not deserve to be, to be killed. In God's providence, this came about. Even though that child was born out of such a sinful situation, nonetheless, the child is a gift from God and should be taken with, with much gratitude. But adultery, I want to tell you this, friends. Adultery is not... God not only sees outward adultery as adultery, but even adultery of the heart. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust, and this accounts for women as well, if you look at a man with lust, then you've committed adultery already in your heart with that person. God sees you as an adulterer. He sees you as someone who has broken that command because He sees your heart. 
He sees the things that you set before your eyes late at night. The, por the pornography that you watch, God sees it, friends. He sees it and He knows that it's adultery. And briefly, you shall not steal. If you've stolen, then you're a thief. And then you shall not bear false witness. As the, as the book of Revelation says, every liar will have their place in the lake of fire. Friends, if you've lied against God, if you've lied to your fellow man, then that is a sin against God. A sin against the Most High. It is a great evil. I do want to say this. Young ladies, I do not only want to address you, but also you young men who are here. You need to man up. I will be much less gracious with you because you need to be a man. A man protects his wife or his, or his girlfriend in this situation. A man would protect his girlfriend and protect his child. You need to man up. You need to repent and believe the Gospel. True manliness is holiness. True manliness is not to be like the world, not to be like the guys on television, those fools, not to be an immature, ungodly pervert. It is to be holy. It is to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. He Himself is the epitome of manliness. So you young men need to repent and believe the Gospel. And you need to protect the weaker vessel. You need to protect that girl, that young lady. You need to guard her with your life. You don't need to let these doctors lay a hand on her or that child. Get them out of here. So concerning God's laws I was speaking on, we have broken it. And therefore, just as a murderer or a rapist here in Greenville County deserves to be punished for having broken the law, so too do we. When we stand before God, we must be punished. It is only just that God would do so. It is only just that God would hold us accountable for having broken His law. And God's punishment for sin is hell. It is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place that has been set apart for the wicked to go. Jesus said this concerning hell in Matthew 9, excuse me, in Mark 9, in verse 43. He says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Friends, Jesus described hell in vivid imagery. It is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The place of outer darkness. The place where the wicked will perish, the place of eternal punishment, as He said in Matthew 25, 46. And I don't want you to go there. But you're on that way. You're on the broad road that leads to destruction. It is either heaven or hell. It is either in eternal bliss in the presence of God or eternal torment where God's wrath will be unleashed upon the wicked. And friends... I care for you. I don't want you to go there. I wouldn't drive this far from Lawrence if I didn't care for you. I care for your souls. I care for where you're going to go. The sin of murder is a very serious sin. Some sins by several aggravations are more heinous in the eyes of God than others, are more perverse and wicked in the eyes of God than others. And murder, actual literal murder, is certainly worse than other sins. And friends, as I said earlier, there is no amount of good deeds that can get you out of this situation. We're lost and hopeless. But I do praise God, praise be to God indeed, that before the world was created, 
God set apart a people unto Himself and covenanted with His Son to come and save us. He sent His Son. They agreed in eternity past that Christ would come into the world to save sinners. Jesus agreed to do it. And when the fullness of the times came, as Galatians 4.4 4 says, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was born under the law. And He came to redeem those who were under the law. The reason I have labored to preach to you the bad news is so that you are stripped of all hope and ultimately that you may look to Christ who is the only hope for sinners. Jesus said in John 3.13, He said, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Friends, Christ has descended from heaven. He has veiled His glory. And He came and fulfilled the law that we, that you and I have broken. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself perfectly, something you and I could never do. He pleased the Father, as Matthew 3.17 says, that the Father declared at the baptism of Christ, He said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He said in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And then, praise be to God that He was lifted up. He was lifted up upon the cross. To use the term that Jesus employed there in John 3, Christ was nailed to that cross as the Lamb of God. There upon that cross, He took the sin of the people of God upon Himself. He bore our iniquities. He Himself carried our sins. Friends, look to Jesus Christ. Don't do this evil. Turn from your sins. Look to the Lamb of God. Look with the eye of faith to the Son of God who was there put to, put to shame. Public shame. He was made a public mockery. And He was credited with having committed the sins of His people, though in fact He never committed one of them. He took ownership of the sins of God's people. That is so precious. That is the love of God, my friends. That is how great the Father's love is for His people. For the church of Jesus Christ, that is the grace of God. The grace of God has been manifested. Upon that cross, Jesus Christ said these words. It says in Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 15.34, it says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Upon that cross, Christ bore the wrath of the Father that we rightly deserve to be poured out on us. That, that sinners rightly deserve to be poured out on them. Christ bore it. Christ stood in the place of sinners. And when Christ died, the wrath of the Father was satisfied. As Isaiah 53.10 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him. How glorious is that indeed. Not an ounce left for the people of God. They themselves are free. We are free, friends. And you ask yourself, how do I know if I am in the people of God? How do I know if I am a part of these, this, this lot of people that Christ died for? Repent and believe the gospel. Then you will know. You will know, yes, I am in these people. I am in this group of people. And after three days in the tomb, Christ was raised... Again, Christ was raised up. The Father rose Him up as the public display that He had received His work. He had received the sacrifice. That the sacrifice was pleasing. It was well pleasing in His sight. And that the sin of the people of God has been done away with. 
Heaven's gates are open for all those who will come to God through Him. Christ Jesus is alive indeed. Alive forevermore. The book of Hebrews says He will never die again. The Father has vindicated His Son because He has accomplished redemption. It has been complete. After 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, Christ then ascended into glory. He ascended back into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. As the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 1.3, and the work of salvation is complete. And as I've said many times before already, the call of the gospel is that you repent and believe it. Now, repentance is a, simply a brokenness over sin, a disgust towards sin, a turning from it, a turning from one's sins that they have been living in. And then belief is simply taking God at His Word, believing that what God has said in the Word of God is true. Believing that Jesus Christ is a sufficient Savior That's the only way of salvation. Jesus said in Luke 24 that it is forgiveness of sins. When you repent and believe the gospel, God forgives you of all sin, past, present, and future because of the work of the Son of God, because of the work of Christ upon the cross. And to go back all the way to Romans 3. Not only that, but you are credited. If you believe upon Christ, credited with the righteousness of Christ, credited with having lived Jesus' perfect life, so that when the Father looks at you, He sees Christ. Because when He looked at Christ upon that cross, those 2,000 years ago, He saw you, if you're His. He saw your sin. Jesus Christ takes my sin, and I receive His perfect righteousness. He receives upon Himself the guilt of my iniquities. And I receive His perfect performance, His righteousness to my account. As a gift of grace. All by God's grace, friends. And I want to briefly say this. For the one who has been truly born again, for the one who has been truly saved, God not only saves them, justifies them, receives them into heaven, but in this life now, they receive a new nature. They are regenerated, to use a biblical term. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, these words, I'll turn there in fact. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says something concerning salvation that is so important. Verse 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Friends, if you say that you are a Christian, if you claim to be a Christian, then you will have a new nature. You will be a new creation. You will now hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves. You will hate sin. You will hate pornography and drunkenness, drug abuse. You'll hate abortion. You'll hate murder. And you will love God and delight in His Word and in prayer and in God's truth because God has given you a new nature. You have been changed if you're truly Christ. But if you say that you know Christ, but you are here this day and you live a life of blatant sin, you do not know Christ. You're a hypocrite. I was like this for eight years said I was a Christian, but I was lost. I was unconverted. I was self-deceived. And my heart is broken because there are many in churches who live in blatant sin and yet do not know the love of Jesus Christ, are not converted. In fact, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He said in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. That is not to say that salvation is by our work. But the evidence of salvation, 
The result of being saved is that we will work for God. We will perform for God because we are grateful. The evidence of conversion is that you now delight in God. Delight in His truth. And your life uh, just, just naturally conforms to God's will. So we work and we bear fruit not to be saved, but because we have been saved. They are not works are not the cause of salvation, but the result. So we can know whether the salvation we claim to have is legitimate or not by whether we live for the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 22, Many will say to me on that day, that is the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If you think yourself to be converted because you have grown up in church, or because a pastor perhaps has told you that you have been, a, you've been converted, friends, that does not mean anything. It is how you are now. Does your life reflect a saving work of God? Or are you simply a hypocrite? There's a special place in hell for hypocrites, friends. And even right now, as you're here this day to, to slaughter your child, that manifests all the more your hypocrisy. You desperately need Jesus Christ. You desperately need the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, to raise you to spiritual life, to quicken, to, to quicken you to life. The one who has been saved will be changed so much so that they will love the things that God loves and they will hate the things that God hates. It is all by grace, friends. All by free grace. All by God's unmerited favor. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now why is that? I said it earlier. It is that God might receive all glory and honor and praise in salvation. And ultimately all things are redounding to God's glory. To use another term, they are working to bring God glory. Whether directly or indirectly, all things are working to that glorious end to bring the, the God of all salvation and all grace all the glory and honor and praise that is due unto Him. That is why Paul in Romans 11, after having thoroughly covered the issue of salvation and God's sovereignty over salvation, he says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen and amen. Indeed, to God be the glory for what He has done in His Son and what He is even continuing to do in the lives of His people up to this very day. And I want to say this as well. The Gospel is not just for the lost, but for saints. If there is any, any Christian, perhaps in the sound of my voice, any Christian who can hear, this Gospel is for you to edify and to, to grow you in grace. If you've examined yourself as I've been preaching and seen whether you live for Christ and you say, yes, I do, I delight in God's truth and I hate sin, glory to God. or Glory to God indeed. And this Gospel is for Christians to feed upon and to rest in, to delight in, and to share with the lost. So do that, my brethren. Do it by the grace of God and for the glory of God. So you lost pagans, you unconverted souls, flee to Christ. You religious, you who say that you know Christ, examine yourselves. If you know not Christ, repent and believe. If you do know Him, praise God, rejoice. 
And may you share this gospel with those who are lost. Please, friends, we're here. I, I'm here to help you. I care for you. My church cares for you. Let us help you. Do not do this evil. Embrace Christ so that you might not be lost eternally. And that you might have the assurance that God will take care of you. If you put your trust in the Most High, He will meet your needs, both eternally and even in this life. All that you need will be added to you. So we have seen in this text in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, the first half of 22. Salvation is by the free grace of God. It is the righteousness of God given to sinners. They are regarded, they are counted, they are credited with having lived Jesus' life. And it's been witnessed by the Old Testament as well and the New. It is for all those who believe. All those who come to Christ and live. We have seen even though God is holy and we have fallen short of His law and we deserve hell, that Christ came to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. He died and rose again, and all who come to Him will be saved by the grace of God and for the glory of God. So may... The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in three and three in one, the God of glory. May He be brought all glory in all things forever and ever. Amen and amen. Amen.